sit and like this. Okay, great. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, generating the data for the this this past year's Wrapped campaign, like the year in review at Spotify. Um, at the last minute, <laughs> uh, so this is not going to be a talk about like you know great ways to do things. This is this is just like a good story of um, a, a good hack. So that's, this is where we're going. Um, about me, uh, Emily Summer, like the season, but with no. Uh, I go by E Summer at work. She, her pronouns, I'm short, I'm a data engineer. Um, I worked at Etsy for a really long time, and then, I mean, three and a half years. Um, I ran away to Spotify, and now I'm back at Etsy. So, <laughs> um, I really love Etsy. Uh, but Spotify was great. I got to work on some cool stuff. Um, cool, so what I was trying to do was, um, aggregate and serve data for 200 million users based on their listening history from the past year. Piece of cake. Um, the marketing team uh, contracted with a third party um, web developer to create this microsite uh, so that when you, uh, that they linked to from um, emails and within the app, because uh, they wanted users to be able to interact with their data. So uh, the idea was you go to this site, click on connect with Spotify, we authenticate, then you get um, some quizzes about like, do you know who your top tracks, top, top track, top artist, and top, top uh, genre are? Um, and then you know, it told you like, yay, you got two out of three or whatever. Uh, it also gave you your um, youngest and oldest genre ages, so based on like average, users listening to a particular genre. And then if you're a premium user, it told you your skip rate and whether that was like high, medium, or low. Um, I skip a lot and it's had some like snarky comment about getting a fidget spinner, which is cute. <laughs> uh, then uh, we gave you two playlists. One was just your top songs. The other was like a discover weekly for the year. Um, uh, I know that this is driving me crazy. It's off. I'm sorry. I just grabbed it from the internet. Um, and then at the end, it gave you this like card that showed your total number of minutes, your genre, artist, whatever. Sadly, this is not mine. I forgot to screenshot my own. My top artist was Robin because I listened to Call Your Girlfriend <laughs> for Pete while training. Um, anyway, so this is the like architectural design. Users hit this microsite. Um, we ping Spotify and authenticate them, then uh, hit a, a, just like a really simple Python API endpoint on App Engine, which uh, looks up the like hash of the username in Data Store, gets a giant JSON blob, and returns that. Um, and so then they can like you know render that your top whatever. Uh, that was fed by BigQuery, and then at the end. Uh, we send you back to Spotify so you can listen to your playlists. Cool. So um, the team at the time was one data scientist slash ex engineer who had kind of designed the, this how this was supposed to work, um, and one panicking product manager. Uh, she co-opted kind of a rogue engineering manager who hauled in a back end engineer who grabbed me, um, and so that's how I got involved. Um, at the time that I was brought in, uh, we were three weeks from public launch and didn't have any of the data in data store yet, so it was a little bit of a nightmare. And the, the, the data scientist that was like the key person on it was headed to Stockholm to work on some like high priority security project. It was a nightmare, it was a nightmare. Um, and this was like the state of things, so. It was a little stressful. Um, uh, yeah, and the, the data scientist, he was also uh, testing the API and kind of making sure that the data was in the structure that the web folks needed. The backend engineer was um, getting our security review passed, uh, setting up um, monitoring, and uh, the poor product manager, she was still coordinating with the teams who were actually generating the playlists and working out kinks in the design. Like, it was a, it was kind of a, you know, hacked together team. It was a fun three weeks. Um, and so, you know, they just said, like, just get the data in data store. Like, that's my job. So that's what I started doing. Um, the data we needed. 
top 50 tracks, artists, and genres for each user, uh, as well as links to or, you know, URLs of associated images and playlists, total minutes played, skips, um, language age, and then the URLs for those custom playlists that have been created. Sources, this was all in BigQuery. Um, I'm not going to read that, but there's actually more tables than that. Um, generally, though, we you know come up with this idea of affinity. So based on your skips and plays, we have an idea of how much you like certain tracks or artists. Um, yeah, there's a lot of tables. Um, quick detour. The reason I was, I think, the reason I was asked to work on this is I just finished working on your time capsule, which was really, really fun to work on. <laughs> um, and in that, the, the task was similar. Like, uh, make playlists for these 200 million users based on their all-time listening history. Um, thankfully, I, in that case, I was working with um, a few other, two other data engineers who knew what they were doing. So I learned a few things that I could apply. Um, in working with, uh, so in, in, for your time capsule, we had we did both um, like uh, Shio MapReduce jobs that ran on Dataflow and some BigQuery work. Uh, so you know I kind of had an idea of when to use which um, BigQuery to, it tended to be more performant in joins because you know it is designed as like a sort of a columnar database. Um, it it failed on ordering large amounts of data. Uh, but since I just needed top 50, I was thinking I'm okay there. Um, Dataflow, you know, if, if your data is already in GCS, just, just stay in GCS. Um, if your data is in BigQuery, though, stay in BigQuery because reading in and out of BigQuery was very slow. Also, just writing a SQL query is a faster fail than, um, you know, compiling your Shio job and getting it up to the cloud and running it. So. I decided to stick with the BigQuery route. But those queries were timing out, so uh, I had to make the big data smaller, and I came up with manual MapReduce in BigQuery. And I'm not kidding when I say manual. Um, so I took the data, and since most of our things were keyed off of user ID, I just split that 200 million users into 14 groups. Um, and why 14? Good question. Uh, I, uh, you know, with like a little experimentation, some of the tables, like artist and genre, were much smaller to join against. Uh, so they, I only needed about seven groups to make that join. I wanted the queries to run in about under 30 minutes so that I know that if they're failing, they're failing. Um, uh, so that was that was like my target number for that. Joining against tracks, that's like an insane amount of data. So I needed, you know, 14 was a more reasonable number, and 7 and 14 mod well with one another. So um, that's why 14. This I literally did this. It's really embarrassing, but this is <laughs> what I was doing: running 14 groups. That's how my Chrome, <laughs> that's how my Chrome looked for each stage of each query, and there were a lot of stages. Um, and then at the end, so that was my map stage, and then I reduced uh, just by unioning all the data at the end. Um, so a few pros and cons of this method. <laughs> Each query was under 30 minutes, because uh, I broke it into tiny little width clauses so that it was easy to pull out and test at each stage. Because you know we didn't have tests to run this against, so I had to you know, run count checks on counts and just make sure the data seemed logical. So I wanted to do that many, many, many times. Um, also, this was key. Um, uh, in, in Google Cloud ecosystem, uh, each project has resource constraints. So I couldn't run too many consecutive or uh, parallel jobs within one project because uh, they'd time each other out. So I used other teams' projects and spread it across five, I got permission, don't worry, but um, spread it across five different projects so no project had more than three queries running at a time. That was huge, that really helped. Um, and honestly, it worked. Like, at the end of the day, that's what I needed to happen. <laughs> um, some cons, uh, it was really annoying and tedious. It was extremely error prone. It's easy to you know, re rewrite over a mod group. Um, and it was not easily repeatable. Uh, so in conclusion, like, keep it simple sometimes. The dumbest solution 
really works. Uh, that's all. Uh, so yeah, I'm Leanne. Uh, I work at Braze, which was formerly at Boys. So for those of you who don't know, uh, our the Braze product is probably on your phone. What we do is we power messaging for like a lot of big companies like Postmates and Lyft and even Meetup. Woo! Um, okay. We love so Braze. Nice. <laughs> uh, so what this talk is about is uh, not CSS. It's about what things can happen when you have lots of people building lots of different things over lots of years in the same code base for the same product. <laughs> and I can talk about this for an entire day. So what I'm going to do is just highlight one little thing I saw in a really big project that I worked on, sort of how things got into this state and how we fixed it. Cool, thank you. Do I press this button? Yep. Yay! Oh. No. 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 <laughs> okay, I can just press the arrow. Um, anyway, so the project is about six months ago, eight months ago, I don't know, I have really bad time recognition. Um, the company I work for decided to rename from AppBoy to Phrase. Uh, my feelings about the name AppBoy also will not fit into a 10 minute talk. So. <laughs> Let's just say that I am very excited to work at a company that does not have the word boy. <laughs> uh, so we decided to rename. Oh, no. Our old product looked like this. So you'll see it. It says like at boy on the left hand side. Like navy was our old color, but that's super out. So we need to look like this now. Uh, new branding, new colors. I was like, okay, I got this. Like. Come on, not that hard. Uh, sorry? Oh, I can do it. It's okay. Uh, just for some CSS, you know? What could happen? What could go wrong? So this is just like a very small screenshot of like a very small piece of our very large product. And I want all of you to guess how many different text colors are in this screenshot. Like not the background, not anything else, just the text. Seven. I got 7, 9, and 20, <laughs> and the answer is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I guess 9 was the closest. And I don't know about y'all, but that's crazy. Um, <laughs> like, this is a very small part of a very large product, and we have 8 different colors. So next thing, how did this happen? Oh, God. Uh, first problem was code bloat. So I'm going to use uh, not this R monolith application, but like a different side project that experienced the same exact problem as an example. Uh, so two years ago, <laughs> when I first joined Braze, uh, my first project was just like, oh yeah, just like write the marketing website. I was like, all right, cool. So I dug this up in GitHub. This is like 2015. I was really excited. I wrote this colors file. First line, yay colors, and it has like 10 colors. <laughs> The colors are arranged really nicely. I gave myself a big pat on the back. It's like the whites, then light gray, mid gray, mid dark gray, oof. dark gray, darker gray, darkest gray. Okay. <laughs> red, a turquoise, adorable. No problems at all. Stopped working on this product, gave it to like two other engineers. Two years later, okay, same file. <laughs> Yay colors, white. Light gray, FA gray, less light gray, mid light gray, mid gray, midish gray, mid dark gray, mid darker gray, dark gray, all the way to gray 999, which makes no sense at all. Uh, you also see here that the naming conventions are totally fucked up. So like here, like these have something to do with like the shade of the color, but then we have stuff here at the bottom right that's just called like careers blue one, careers blue two, careers blue three. So now we're starting to get a picture for like why we have eight different colors on a small screen. Because if you're a developer and you're building, I don't know, the about page, you're not going to use Careers Blue 2 because that's for the Careers page. Come on, you're going to add dark teal secondary instead, of course. <laughs> Why not? And so this was, as I said, this was kind of like a smaller project. The same exact thing happened on our main application code base. It's just worse. Um, so, and all, by the way, this is all blameless. Like, no, it's like no one engineer like fucked this up. Like honestly, like of the like eight colors in my small screenshot, I found out that I personally contributed three of them. So <laughs> <laughs> nothing like no. I know people who work here are here. Like it's not your fault. I promise. Okay. Second 
think, uh, was poor communication, both between departments and between members of the engineering team. And so here, I literally went into my downloads file and dug for like two years ago, and I found one of the specs that I got from a designer for that fixed bottom nav bar. And so when I was making this project, this button, these things, like these arrows, like all this stuff already existed in other places on our code base. And yet, in this spec, I'm getting hex codes. So as a developer, I think we're all kind of perfectionists. Like I get a spec from a designer, like I want to make that thing look pixel perfect. You know, it's just kind of the thing we do. And so when I see something like this, of course, I'm going to submit my pull request and I'm going to make that thing the exact color that that designer told me to make it. Uh -huh. And so we get PRs, let's say they're like 200, 300 lines. Three of those lines have like a hard coded color in them. Like, you know, when a, someone is doing a code review, like, am I really going to like focus on like what this color is over like whether our product actually works? No, not a big deal. But now I'm the front end tech lead, so when I see these pull requests, it makes me <laughs> very, very sad. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to get into how I sort of came to this conclusion because we don't have a lot of time. Um, I'm just going to present it to you and show how it sort of helped to fix or make some of these things a little less, you know, immediately a problem. Um, and I went and I thought of this completely new approach that has never been used in computer science ever, uh, which is to add a layer of abstraction. Yeah, because we all write in assembly, right? You know, of course. Um, so what that meant was in the old world, it was perfectly accessible to use any hex code. I mean, it wasn't like you were really supposed to like use the color style, but no one ever did. But like, it wasn't super taboo. And so if you use every hex code, that's what, 16 to the sixth, or about 17 million colors that could possibly be used as like the blast radius for the colors on our site. In this new world, um, just add a layer in between. It's a file I made called colors.less. And that file has about 200 colors. And you can use any of the colors on that file, go crazy, but only those. And if we see a hex code in, in the diff, nah. <laughs> use the color in the colors file. So here are some snapshots of just like how that new file looked. Um, one thing I want to point out is that in this new world, we're no longer naming stuff like light gray, mid gray, dark gray. We decided to go for something fun, which is Crayola colors. Um, our options for color naming are really like, name something based on where it gets used. But I sort of alluded to earlier that if you do that, you'll enter into a world where someone calls something like careers blue, and then it never gets used on any other page ever again. And then if you name something based on its shade, well, you know, I'm not stupid enough to assume that over the course of many years and many different objectives and lots of different product decisions, we're going to add tons and tons of colors to this file. And so we don't want to enter again into the world where it's like light, lightest, mid light, something else, something else, something else. And so this is like something that's really expandable um, and also kind of fun. Like we have a millennial pink in here too, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think I show it. Um, so you'll see here that like this is another pretty low level file on our site for just our CSS. It's like our variables file. We use like there's probably at least like two three hundred morning breads on our site, and even here like where it may be accessible to use a hex code, we're still using colors from the colors file. So just really enforcing that across the board. Um, so I first gave this talk uh, to the engineering team right after it launched, and so I didn't really get a chance to talk about this stuff, which is pretty exciting, which is to see if this actually solved the problem. Um, and I think the answer to that is, in the ways that I wanted it to, kind of, yeah. So these are some pull requests that I like found from whatever got merged. And you'll see that like here, like there are no more hex codes. It's like all a bunch of like coolly named Crayola colors. And here there's some variables that also point to colors. It's not perfect because inactive gray here is actually just gray stardust, so they probably should have just used it, but you know, I'm pretty happy about it. It's fine for me. <laughs> um, I do want to say that this seems like it did a pretty good job of fixing it, but probably not forever. I think, again, building things with lots of different people over lots of years, a single code base that has to do lots of different things is very, very hard. Um, so I guess we'll see. Anyway, my company is hiring if you need a job. So. <laughs> uh, go there if you want. It. Um, and that's how you can get in touch with me. And uh, thanks a lot.
from. Um, but I didn't just choose this picture randomly. Uh, did you know that sea otters actually hold hands while they're sleeping? It's, oh, I know, it's, it's really cute. Um, and they do this so uh, while they're sleeping, they don't drift out at sea, so they always stay together. And I think um, as more and more women are leaving the tech industry, 45% uh, more frequently than men, I think uh, we have a lot to learn from the sea otters here. So uh, <laughs> tonight I'm going to talk about something, um, probably one of the worst things that's ever happened to me professionally, um, but what I learned from it was the importance of sticking together. So let's get started. Um, so my name is Peggy Rezus, and I am an open source engineer at Apollo, where I work on um, building tools to help make GraphQL more accessible um, to everyone. Uh, but I'm actually not going to talk about any of that today. I'm not going to talk about GraphQL or React, but if you do have any questions, you can just contact me um, on my Twitter there. But uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, something that happened to me at a conference. And as an open source engineer, I travel to conferences all the time, all around the world. And for the most part, uh, my experiences have been really positive. Like I, I get to go to cool new countries and meet amazing people. Um, but uh, this story in particular was really quite troubling. So um, the story takes place uh, really far away from New York City, all the way in uh, Bratislava, Slovakia for Reactive Conf um, last October. And uh, you know, I was really excited. I put a lot of work into my talk. I traveled halfway around the world and I was actually missing the GraphQL conference that my company sponsored in order to attend this event. Which is why it was so shocking to receive this as my speaker gift. Um, so the conference organizers actually photoshopped my face onto a picture of Wonder Woman without my consent. They printed it out and they framed it. I, I don't know where they thought I was gonna put it in my house, maybe next to pictures of my family, like next to my TV. I, I don't really know, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was pretty rough. Um, and on top of that, they were going to display this picture on the big screen uh, as I walked out to give, give my talk about GraphQL in front of over a thousand attendees as they had already done for all the speakers uh, that day. So this, they gave me the picture uh, after the, the night of the speaker's dinner after day one of the conference had already ended. Um, and yeah, I, I, was, I was in such shock, you know, like I think it's really hard as a woman in tech uh, being taken seriously. I think people look at me, they're like, you're young, you're blonde, you're not like a GraphQL expert. Um, and you know, I regularly get questions from men uh, during my talks asking if I actually know how to code. Um, I've had my ass grabbed at conferences, and uh, yeah, I, I receive like dirty comments on my talk videos quite frequently. So uh, the organizers never really considered like how troubling this picture would be to me because by per you know images of superheroes they're they're sexualized. And by portraying me in a sexualized way, that only opens the door to more harassment and for incidents like that to take place. So um, when I received this photo, I was like really uncomfortable. It was right before the speaker's dinner. I like excused myself. I, I went back to my hotel room and I talked to some members of my team. And together we decided that I was going to withdraw from the conference and that I was not going to present, given how troubling this image was. Um, so I like literally threw my bags in a suitcase, or uh, my clothes in a suitcase, and I ran to the trans train station in Bratislava and embarked upon uh, like one of the craziest journeys of my life. It was 24 hours of traveling. I went uh, from Bratislava to Prague, Prague to Frankfurt, Frankfurt to San Francisco, all to give my talk um, the next afternoon at GraphQL Summit. Uh, yeah. Thanks. It was crazy. I like stepped off the plane. I curled my hair in the airport bathroom. <laughs> this girl was like, "You fancy?" I was like, "Yeah." I guess so. <laughs> Put on some deodorant. Gave my talk an hour later. It was great. Um, and yeah, luckily our developer relations lead, she kind of took the lead on contacting the organizers and letting them know that I was no longer going to be attending. Um, so yeah, so, so really like the reason, the, the number one reason why this image was so problematic is they never asked for my consent. They never asked for my consent, um, you know, before the conference saying that they were going to be doing this for us. And that's really like why it was so troubling to me. Um, another reason was because I think 
On the organizers demonstrated a complete lack of empathy for like how this image could affect me and how why it would be troubling for women in tech to receive a photoshopped picture like them. Um, yeah, it was it was really bad. But that's not the worst thing that happened, uh, if you can believe it. It got even worse. Um, yeah, so I, I landed in San Francisco and I opened my phone only to receive an influx of tweets from the organizers publicly shaming me, calling me a child. Uh, I then like had some DMs from my friends who said they were trying to like cover everything up that happened on the conference Slack, saying that we did give our consent to have these like hard pictures displayed on the big screen. Um, yeah, and then I got some like nasty emails uh, from the organizers saying that like I was portraying them as sexist, evil aggressors. Um, yeah, it was it got really bad. So that's what prompted me to write this blog post. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah, I wrote this blog post. I was really nervous to publish it because I had no idea what was going to happen. I was like ready for the trolls to like just clog up my inbox and like never be able to read any of my emails again. Um, but yeah, I, uh, shockingly, this, uh, the response was really positive, and I think it's because I'm privileged in a way, right? Like, I'm not a first-time speaker. My company supported me. I'm not a woman of color. I think uh, had any of those things been true, the situation might have played out a lot differently. And that's why I think it's really important to stick together, um, to stand up for women who are being harassed, but not just women, for people of color, people with disabilities and trans folk as well. I think we all need to stick together and advocate for people who are being harassed in any form, on the job or at conferences. Um, so I don't really want to dwell on like what happened or like what could have happened, but I want to talk about some takeaways and maybe some things that, um, you know, had I realized could have probably played out differently. So the first would be um, to trust your gut. I think like if it is if it sounds shady, it probably is. There were definitely some clues that could have um, told me how I was going to be treated at the conference. So if you um, are speaking or even attending, if you don't see a code of conduct prominently listed on their website, if you don't see uh, mentions that the venue is accessible for people with disabilities, if you don't see um, if you don't get your travel arrangements reimbursed promptly, that's probably a sign that this organization is not something that you want to invest your time in. So um, trust your gut. It's much easier to cancel your ticket or withdraw from the conference if you do see those signs before and not during. Um, yeah. <laughs> On the flip side, I think it's really important to support inclusive events, um, ones that do commit to um, you know, organizing a conference with a diverse lineup or um, taking dietary restrictions into account when uh, organizing their food or providing services like childcare. I think it's really important for all of us to recognize those organizers who are doing a great job, vote with our wallets and attend um, conferences that are inclusive. I think if you're in a leadership position um, and you're sponsoring conferences, make sure that you sponsor conferences that align with your corporate values because um, you, know, you don't want to give your money to an organization that doesn't reflect what you're trying to portray. And finally, uh, call it bad behavior if you can. So this is kind of with an asterisk. I think in some situations, um, maybe you're in fear of like losing your job or you're worried about additional harassment. In those situations, maybe you don't want to call out publicly. I think it's totally OK to, um, you know, for small incidents, maybe contact the organizers directly or uh, maybe have a friend do it, leave an anonymous tip. But either way, if we leave these incidents um, just going without any repercussions, they're going to keep happening. I, when I actually published the post, I had like four people DM me with incidents that had happened at that conference in previous years, and they thanked me for coming forward and drawing attention to what these organizers were doing to people. So I think it's really important for us to just work up the courage. It's definitely not easy, um, but to call out bad behavior when you see it. And for all of us in this room, if we see someone that's being mistreated, to definitely um, you know, support them publicly on Twitter or you know, in person, whatever it may be. So um, I'm not going to be able to change the culture of tech events alone. I need everyone in this room um, to help me. And I think together, if we, you know, we call up bad behavior, we support inclusive events, and we trust our gut when it comes to conferences, I think we can uh, change the culture of tech events for the better. So we don't have to keep reading blog post after blog post about the conference horror story of the week. Um, so together I'm confident that we can do this. 
Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rixandra Levy. I lead the mobile apps engineering team. I joined ZocDoc, uh, the ZocDoc team, a little over two months ago. Um, and uh, before this, I was at Guild and Sachs working on their mobile apps. Uh, you'll be also happy to know that I'm the last talk of the day, so thank you again for coming, and uh, I'm glad you made it through to this talk. Um, so today, um, I wanted to talk to you about the hottest topics in mobile app development. Um, Swift, Kotlin, React Native, Flutter, um, actually I'm just kidding. Uh, I want to really talk to you about some of the problems that we've encountered in the mobile app world over the years and some solutions that we've come up with. Uh, first, uh, let's start with the basics. Um, how we go about building apps. In some ways, building iOS and Android apps is a lot like uh, building things in the 90s uh, in the Shrinkcraft uh, software uh, days, where you have all of these app builds that you're releasing and you have to make sure that every release is in top shape um, because it's going to likely live for a very long time. Uh, it's not like you have your service, you're deploying it, and by the end of the deploy you know that um, everyone is going to get the correct fix. Um, so you end up with something that looks like this. You basically have a long tail of users who are always on the um, on older uh, app versions. Um, and the reason this happens is because some, people's are, uh, some people are just not uh, prone to change, so they might turn off automatic updates, or they might just be on older devices. So if you have a minimum uh, SDK version or a minimum uh, iOS version to apply to your app, then they actually can't upgrade to the latest versions. Uh, luckily, we've developed a lot of strategies uh, to deal with this. Um, so one thing, and this would seem very basic, but bear with me, you'd be surprised. Um, all the API endpoints that your apps are hitting should be versioned. Um, that way, whenever you want to make a drastic change, then the latest versions of the apps are going to hit the latest versions of the APIs, um, and the old versions of the apps can keep doing whatever they were doing in a backwards compatible way. Um, we also have other strategies, things like integrated into the apps, um, different um, UI views, um, which uh, can be prompted remotely in order to uh, deprecate certain app versions. Um, this is very useful whenever something goes uh, terribly wrong with one of the app versions, um, or if uh, you want to deprecate one of the API versions. And of course, it's best practice to keep as much logic on the backend side. Um, that way, you know, things like uh, copy and translations to uh, anything that you can. That way, um, whenever you are uh, making a drastic change, um, you are uh, able to make it a lot easier. And of course, you're not duplicating code across multiple clients. Uh, there comes a time when we all have to think about the buy versus build question. Um, of course, uh, building your own tools allows you to have a lot of flexibility, um, but the, at the same time, um, if it's not core to your business, then is it really worth spending the time to do? Um, so uh, for, for this, we've also come up with a, a few considerations. You know, for, for SDKs, if you're including third-party code into your apps, um, it can lead to a lot of increased crashes in many cases, especially if an SDK is a binary file where you can't actually see um, the code before you're releasing it live. Um, and on every, uh, I don't know if you can see in the back, but on every single app submission, we have to uh, sign something that looks like this. Basically, we're telling Apple that we have personally checked every single piece of code in the app including third-party code, and we know exactly um, what is in there and how the advertising identifier is being used. Um, of course, if you have a binary SDK, um, many times you wouldn't be able to answer this accurately, but it also uh, jeopardizes our careers as iOS engineers. Um, again, we have strategies to deal with this. Um, so mobile app engineers have created kill switches for um, SDKs. You can um, basically put a flag for uh, every SDK in your app and then easily turn it off whenever you see any curse and, and crashes or anything else goes wrong. Um, <laughs> the other thing that uh, I've come across over the years is 
as you're working with vendors, um, sometimes the best solution is working with vendors who provide really great, clean API solutions that are well documented. Of course, there aren't a ton of them out there, so it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to find them. Uh, so please join me on this quest to push vendors to provide better uh, solutions side by side with their SDKs. Um, uh, the reason why I found this to be a very good compromise is because um, if you can use the APIs, then you're using a lot of the functionality that they provide, but you can still uh, modify the interface in order to make it really yours and stand out for your brand and the flow that you want to create. Um, <laughs> and since we're on the topic of APIs, uh, cookies and apps don't generally go very well uh, together. So if you're working on a service that might one day be used by a mobile app, um, please consider uh, just switching uh, cookie functionality with headers. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, just keep that in mind. In fact, the advertising identifiers that I mentioned earlier were created because um, it, on iOS and Android, you couldn't rely on cookies to track uh, for advertising. Um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about linking in mobile apps. Um, so the links that lead to apps are traditionally called deep links. Um, they look like, like this. You basically have a protocol that is specific to your app. In this case, you have uh, ZocDoc. And then the app basically parses the whole link and figures out exactly uh, where to navigate you, which page, and which attributes uh, it should show you. Um, this has been working great for a long time, works on iOS, works on, on Android. Um, however, in, in, iOS, in iOS 9, there was a little bit of a disruption. Um, uh, with, with Apple, um, uh, basically what happened was for mobile apps, you know, generally conversion tends to be a little bit higher than mobile web. So a lot of people came up with all of these hacks in order to redirect traffic as much as possible from mobile web to mobile apps. Uh, and they were doing all of these automatic redirects based on these deep links. Apple didn't really like that experience, especially in certain cases when marketing uh, campaigns were uh, leading folks to apps where they didn't want to go. Um, so they introduced uh, an alert view that would say, are you sure you want to open this link in the following app? Um, it created a very frustrating experience, um, and uh, it continued to be so until very shortly after um, Apple launched Universal Links. Uh, what universal links are, they sound amazing. Um, basically, um, you have a regular HTTP or HTTPS link, and once you tap on it, it takes you directly into the app. Uh, of course, Apple being Apple, they're very worried about security, which is great. Um, so you would have to do this double connection uh, in order to make it happen. On your domain, you would have to put in a file called Apple App Site Association, uh, where you're specifying the exact uh, unique app identifier um, that you can link to and the paths, and then on your app side, which domain that you would accept. Um, so, you know, easy enough, you're doing this, it works, now whenever a uh, user taps on these links, they go straight into your app. Enter ESPs. <laughs> Uh, also known as email service providers. Um, these are vendors that provide uh, marketing for, uh, through emails, and as you can see from the stats, um, quite a lot of businesses use them. Um, the reason they were an issue for, uh, for universal links is because they manage separate domains uh, for, track, uh, for tracking. And so you would have to have that whole setup through ESVs uh, which they didn't actually end up doing until many months after it was launched. Which brings me to my last topic, uh, data tracking. With all of these cool new ways to link into the apps, um, there came the question of how are we actually going to track all of these things. Um, the solution that we landed on was to put UTM parameters in uh, all deep links and all universal links. Uh, aligned with marketing on exactly what we're going to name those um, and tracking them separately uh, side by side with other paid marketing campaigns or internal mar marketing campaigns in order to get a full breakdown of source attribution. In closing, there are no silver bullets for some of these issues that I've presented, but there are certainly a lot of solutions around them. 
Um, so, you know, I hope you take something away as you're building something in Kotlin or Swift or React Native or Flutter. Thank you.